In this video, we are going to continue with finding maxima and minima of functions. And the types of functions that we're going to look at this time, a wider variety of functions, as opposed to the last video that had purely polynomials. OK, so our basic plan for to do this is the same. Our strategy is just the same. First, we are going to locate the stationary points. These are the places where the derivative is 0. Then we locate the singular points, if there are any. These are the places where the derivative isn't defined. And these are spots where typically you find your function has a 0 in the denominator. So for instance, if our denominator looked like the cube root of x minus 4, we would make sure that x couldn't equal 4, because that would give us a 0 in the denominator. Then we're going to look at those endpoints. Those are given to us usually. And once we have all of our dis different possibilities for places to have a maxima or a minima, then we are going to classify each point as either a relative max, a relative min, an absolute max, an absolute min, or maybe it doesn't qualify as any of those. Maybe it's a stationary point, but it isn't a max or a min. Maybe it's just a pause on the way up. So this would be a stationary point right here, but clearly isn't a, it isn't a high and it isn't a low of our function. Okay, so here we go. Our first example, we are supposed to find the exact location of all of the relative and absolute, absolute extrema of this function. So when they tell us exact, that means we only answer a decimal answer if it's a terminating decimal. Say 0 0.5 is a terminating decimal. It's a decimal that ends, and so we could answer that as a, an answer. But um, 1 third, which is 0.333, and it, that goes on forever, we couldn't answer 0.33, because that wouldn't be exact. OK, so our function here um, is f of x equals x minus the quantity x minus 1 to the 2 thirds. And just to remind you here, when I have a exponent like this, that means that that is the cube root of x minus 1 squared. That's another way to, to think about that. OK, so um, first we need to find those stationary points. So I'm going to find the derivative. So the derivative of this function, the derivative of the x is just 1 minus bring that exponent down, 2 thirds x minus 1 to the negative 1 third. And I want to set this equal to 0. So I have, let's see, I'm going to move this whole thing over on the right. So I have 1 equals 2 thirds times x minus 1 to the negative 1 third. And um, let's rewrite this. So this would be, um, and, and actually let's divide or multiply both sides by 3 halves too. So I'm going to have 3 halves equals, if I multiply by 3 halves that makes that 2 thirds go away. And at the same step I'm going to rewrite this negative exponent. So this is going to equal 1 over the square cube root of x minus 1. So I have that 3 halves equals 1 over the cube root of x minus 1. I can cross multiply here and I have 3 times the cube root of x minus 1 equals 2. Divide by 3. I have the cube root of x minus 1 equals 2 thirds. So we're getting closer on solving for this x, but x is still stuck inside this cube root, so I'm going to cube both sides. So I have x minus 1, um, 2 cubed is 8, 3 cubed is 27, add 1 to both sides, and I get x equals uh, 35 27 So that is our only stationary point. Okay, so let's look at singular points. So remember the singular points occur where your derivative is undefined. So if we look at our derivative, 
I could have it written just like that, but I'm going to rewrite that so that my exponent is um, positive. So it's going to be 2 over 3 times the cube root of x minus 1. Now, this here, I can't let that equal to 0 because that would give me a 0 in the denominator. So I need to make sure that x, um, we, we don't want x to equal 1 in our derivative. So x equals 1, that is a singular point. That is where our derivative is undefined. Okay, endpoints. So they give us one endpoint. That's x equals 0. So I'm going to go ahead and put these three values into my table. 35 27 1, and 0. And I am going to put my function into my y1. And I believe I have it in my y1. Yep, I have it in my y1. Let's go ahead and build this table by going to the table function. And I have some leftover stuff in my table, so I'm going to delete that. So I need 35 divided by 27. I need 1 and I need 0. Okay, so um, the 35 27 I think that is probably a fraction. So we're, I'm not going to write that down right now. I'm going to show you another way to get it. At 1, my y value is 1. At 0, my y value is negative 1. Let's quit out of here. Now remember, my y, my function f of x is in my y1. So I could also go vers, y vers, function y1, and plug in 35 27 this way. And then I can get that value, see it's a long decimal here, and I can even see that it appears to be there There might be some bit of a pattern going on, so I bet it, I can turn it into a fraction. So to turn it into a fraction I can go math, 2 fraction, enter, and I get 23 27. I could also plug it in by hand, that's, that's another option. So I have my three spots, my three places where I might have extrema. So all I need to do now is classify them. So let's go to the graph. Before I actually draw the graph, let's make sure our window is appropriate. The x min and the x max, x max will match this interval. So it starts at 0. We can't go to infinity, but we'll, we'll just go to 10. x scale of 1 looks good. The y's here you know, go from negative 1 up to less than 1. So let's go from negative 2 up to, say, 5. This point here, this is an endpoint. But more importantly, if I look at my graph, this is the absolute minimum y value. So this is our absolute min because it's our smallest y value overall. This point here, 1, 1, that is this little um, corner that we've got going on there. If we blew that graph up, let's go ahead and do that real quick. Let's, instead of going from negative 0 to 10, let's just go to 5. And just up to 2, so we can see what's going on there in that spot a little bit better. So do you see that kind of corner that we have going on, a, a point? That's where our derivative is undefined. And that, to me, looks like it's a slight high spot on our graph. So this was a singular point. And it is a relative max. It's not our biggest, but it is a relative max. And then this other point, this stationary point that we had here, that is right about there. And that is a stationary relative min.
Now notice that um, the extreme value theorem doesn't apply here because I don't have that closed bounded interval. So we don't have an absolute maximum. So there is no absolute max. So let's look at a second example. So in this example, we have a different function g. One thing to notice here is that we do not have a closed bounded interval, so we can't be sure that we're going to have a absolute max or an absolute min. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. The first thing we need to do is find those stationary points. So let's calculate the derivative of g. So g prime of x is going to equal, so here I've got a product. I've got x times that e to the 4 minus x squared. So I got to use the product rule. So the derivative of the x is 1, then we have e to the 4 minus x squared plus x. The derivative of the e is just 4 minus e to the 4 minus x squared, but we have to multiply by the derivative of that exponent, which is negative 2x. If I multiply this all out, I'm going to have e to the 4 minus x squared minus, I have an x and a negative 2x, so that's going to be 2x squared e to the 4 minus x squared, and I'm setting this equal to 0. One strategy when you're setting things equal to 0 is to factor. Let's factor at the e to the 4 minus x squared. This term will just be 1 this term will be minus 2x squared equal to 0, and so we have e to the 4 minus x squared equals 0, or 1 minus 2x squared equals 0. There are actually no solutions from this because this is an exponential function, and so there's no way to take a number, 2.72 is about what e is, and raise it to some other number and get 0. This does have a solution though. We can move the 2x squared onto the right, divide by 2, and I have x squared is 1 half, square root both sides, I get x equals plus or minus the square root of 1 half, and if you simplify that's going to be plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. All you have to do is um, take the square root of the numerator, square root of the denominator, and then um, rationalize that denominator. Multiply by square root of 2 over square root of 2. So those are our only stationary points, these two values here. So singular points. So here's our derivative function, our g prime of x, and um, it, there are no problems here. I don't have any x's in the denominator, so I don't have to worry about the denominator becoming zero, so there are no singular points. Our original domain, our interval, is negative infinity to positive infinity, so we have no endpoints. So the only two possibilities we have for our max and min are at these two values, square root of 2 over 2 and negative square root of 2 over 2. So let's find our two y values. First, let's plug our function into our y1. Here I have my function in my y1. I'm going to go to my table, delete the previous values in my table, and enter square root of 2 over 2, and negative square root of 2 over 2. So here are y values, they're, they're decimal numbers again, and I probably should have, when I wrote the statement of this problem out, left out that exact part. We can give the exact on the x's, but because we have an exponential function, it's not so easy to give the exact on the y's. We can do it. I, typically in our homework program, they would allow uh, decimal values here. So let's go ahead and put those in. So we're just going to use the decimal values for our y's. Let's look at the graph. So our window, our graph is going from negative infinity to positive infinity, and these values here are 
square root of 2 is about 1.41, so that's going to be less than 1. So let's just go from, say, negative 5 to 5. We can tell from our y values here that they get pretty big, so let's go from, say, negative 30 to 30. And a y scale of 5 is good. We're going to press graph. First of all, let's classify these two points. So we can tell from our graph that these two are these highs and lows of our function. So these are both stationary. And um, there, this one is the stationary absolute max. And this one here is the stationary absolute min. Let's kind of investigate what's going on over here, because it appears on this graph like the graph just stops right here. Let's trace and see what's really going on. As we move to the right, watch what's happening to our y values. They're getting closer and closer and closer to zero. So these y values look like they're just right on that x-axis, but they don't ever actually really reach it. And so we've got basically a horizontal asymptote going on. So as x gets really large, so for instance, as x tends towards positive infinity, our y values are going to zero. And we'd have the same thing for the other direction. As x tends towards negative infinity, our y values are getting close to zero. Those are our only two extrema though, this one and this one, and they're our absolute max and absolute min.